What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. As always, it's your boy Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. The week seven outlook video that I always do. Running through key injuries, must starts, must sits, some sell high by low candidates. My fantasy league recaps, locks of the centuries. Uh, if you missed either of the articles that I put out on Tuesday, make sure you are subscribed to the newsletter on my website, B-D-G-E-A-T. Dot com. Make sure you're following me on Twitter. You know what? Go follow me on Instagram too. I need some love on the IG. Go, go, will like for like. So go follow me on all those things. I put out my waiver wire sheet. It comes out every Tuesday as well as the murky running back situation Excel sheet, I guess I put on there. Just breaking down the week prior, any of the backfields that are kind of split up, the snap percentages, the stats and things like that. Very useful for you guys because most of the time you can't get that stuff for free. You have to be subscribed to like a premium service. You got to pay subscription, that kind of shit. Your boy is giving it to you for free. So go check that out, subscribe to the newsletter, and let's get right into the video. Also, don't forget to thumbs up the video because that's how other people find me. The more y'all interact with the video, the more randos can come to my site and talk shit and do whatever they want in the comment section. So we got to start off with key injuries as always. And the biggest one for week six, the NFL is Aaron Rodgers. Suffers his broken clavicle, right? On his throwing shoulder, which basically means he's going to miss the entire season. Their backup, Brent Hundley, came in. He had only attempted 11 passes in his career prior to Rodgers going down, which... I don't want to say it's the biggest downgrade in the history of the NFL, but it's probably the biggest downgrade in the history of the NFL. Aaron Rodgers to Brent Hundley. He came in. He actually, if you watch the tape, he didn't play horribly. He wasn't like overshooting every wide receiver. The numbers didn't end up well, though. He, he threw three interceptions on just 33 attempts. Now, you know, he knows the system well, so the coaches can trust him, and uh, he is going to be the starting quarterback going forward. This is a major downgrade to the Packers' weapons, their wide receivers. I think the biggest hit here would be to Jordy Nelson, right? And it's easy to say, but I think I think the reason is because the connection that Aaron Rodgers and Jordy Nelson have is not like the normal, you know, he's the best wide receiver, I'm just going to throw him the ball. Like those two went together like a lamb and tuna fish, right? If there was ever a third down conversion they needed, if he needs to squeeze a tight ball into the end zone and the red zone, that's where him and Jordy had that crazy, crazy, like, white boy connection. You know what I mean? So that's something that Hundley and Jordy Nelson are not going to have. Jordy was tied for first in the NFL in targets inside the 10-yard line with Dez. So that's something you might not see happen, right? Game to game, week to week, you could almost bet on Jordy Nelson scoring a touchdown, and I think that's not going to be the case anymore. Obviously, the connection's out there. The offense isn't going to run as smoothly without Rodgers. Um, so I would look at him as more of like a high-end wide receiver too now, uh, and definitely temper expectations. If you could sell him still at the at the same name value or something, I would go do that, but I'm not looking to actively sell him because he's still a great receiver. He's still going to be heavily involved in that offense. Who I don't think it actually kills is Devonta Adams, though. I think when you have a quarterback who doesn't have a great connection with any of the wide receivers, for the most part, he's going to look for the best matchups. And, you know, he's not going to be like Rodgers where he forces the ball to Jordy because he trusts him no matter who's covering him. They're playing against a Minnesota team, right? And Xavier Rhodes is on uh, Jordy or they're playing, you know, another top tier cornerback that's covering Jordy. I don't think Hunley would force the ball to him like Aaron, Aaron Rodgers would. So Adams is going to always have like the second best or the best matchup on this team. He might not be the best wide receiver, but he'll have the best matchup. And I think that will kind of turn into... Um, targets feeding towards Adams. And he's already one of like the highest targeted red zone guys in the league. And I think this just, this kind of helps his overall target value. Cobb is, you know, he's been inconsistent basically all year. So he's kind of a coin flip. It's going to be weird to see them going forward and how this kind of breaks out. Um, for Martellus Bennett, I don't think it makes it. Usually these kind of moves don't really take a huge toll on tight ends because the, the new, the new quarterback comes in and kind of has to um, rely on someone there, a reliable, short, over-the-middle kind of target, and Bennett would be that guy. Any tight end really would. So not much change for Bennett. I wasn't really high on him to begin with. Probably a low tight end one in 12-team leagues, maybe like 12 to 15 ranking going forward. Um, I mean, I, Hunley himself, I don't think he's like the worst fantasy quarterback, right? He, he's, think of the situation he's in. He's in a great situation. Really good weapons around him. 
he has the rushing upside. Um, just some stats you should know about him, right? He runs like a 4'6", 4'6", 40-yard dash, which is like 91st percentile for quarterbacks. He has like a 98th percentile spark score for quarterbacks. So he's the athlete that, you know, you'll hear it all week, basically. He's the athlete that you think he is. He was a fifth-round pick from Green Bay in um, 2015. They traded up to get him. So, I mean, I'm not going to believe the, oh, they love him because they traded up to get him. That was three years ago. It was the fifth round. Like, relax. They're not trading up to get Patrick Mahomes in, uh, with the 10th pick overall. So slow the brakes on there. I would say if you're in a 2QB league and you lost Rodgers or you're in desperate need of a quarterback, I would probably put a lot of fat budget I know the wave wire is already over, but for whenever the next one is, I would probably throw a lot of money towards Hundley because of the upside there, and there's not a lot of players usually on the wire in two quarterback leagues that have this type of upside. Now, they play New Orleans at home in week seven, uh, over under 47 and a half. They're five point underdogs. And, you know, they don't have like that crazy of matchups going forward. They get Detroit at home, Chicago, tough matchup with Baltimore and Pitt. Then they get Tampa Bay and Cleveland. So going forward, it's not like it's not like the Green Bay offense is going to be the worst in the NFL, right? He Hundley's competent. Uh, these wide receivers are still great athletes, great players. So it's not crazy. And I wrote about this in my waiver wire. Now, it's tough to replace Aaron Rodgers, but you got to look at matchups going forward. And I was looking at Tyrod Taylor, Andy Dalton, and I'm putting it up on the screen. If you look at you know their matchups going forward, if you combine the two, and they were widely available in in most leagues. I think it was Dalton was like. 46% owned and, and Tyrod Taylor was even less than that. If you were able to get both of these guys, combine them over the next 10 weeks or whatever of the fantasy regular season, like you're getting great, great, great matchups if you combine the two. It's Tampa Bay, Indy, the Jets, then you get to pick between the Saints, Tennessee. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you could see you could easily weather the storm. They're not going to give you Rodgers on a week-to-week -week basis, but they are not going to give you that much lower of production there. So there are definitely ways, you know, your season's not over, right? There are ways to combat this. And I, the, the combo of Tyrod and Dalton, if they're both still available on the wire, is one of my favorite ways to do that. Woo! Next, we got Jameis Winston. Mr. Krabs is probably... Not probably, but one of the more disappointing fantasy players of this season, right? He was so, everyone was so high on him coming into the season. I remember at one point he was like quarterback six in fantasy, which is fucking ridiculous to begin with, but been really disappointing. He's like quarterback 17 so far. He sprained his AC joint in his throwing shoulder. They say he's day to day. Dirk Cutter, the head coach, says that as he understands it, Jameis is going to be medically cleared and it's more of like a pain tolerance thing. Is he going to be able to, you know, get the ball down the field? And that's gonna be up to Jameis. They're not gonna let him throw throughout the week. They're not gonna they're not gonna let him throw until like probably like Friday, I would say. So we're really not gonna know much here, but I would definitely have a backup plan in place. Uh, because one, if he is playing, he's definitely gonna be less than 100 percent He's gonna have trouble getting the ball downfield. Uh, so definitely have a backup plan in place. Ryan Fitzpatrick will be the backup. He came in and actually played really well from a fantasy perspective. 22 of 32, 290 passing yards, three touchdowns, two interceptions. So you'll take that any day of the week from your fantasy quarterback. Almost 300 yards, three touchdowns. So it's not going to kill Mike Evans. It's not going to kill Deshaun Jackson. It's not going to kill Cameron Brait. It hurts the offense as a whole. But he, Fitzpatrick, is, you know, he's been in the NFL for a while. He's more than competent. He's more than capable of leading an offense down the field. I mean, I don't think he'll take as many, he'll force as many balls to Mike Evans. He's probably a, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, but apparently Ryan Fitzpatrick went to Harvard. And apparently Antonio Gates played basketball in college. So uh, if you haven't heard that, that's just like some crazy stuff that only you can get here at Big Dog's Gotta Eat. Like we bring those facts to you. Anyways, they get week seven versus Buffalo. Buffalo's been very, very, very good against quarterbacks. Another reason just to downgrade Jameis overall. Third fewest fantasy points allowed to the quarterback position this year. They have not allowed multiple passing touchdowns to a quarterback yet this year. And in four of the five games, Buffalo has picked off the starting quarterback at least twice. So they are a very, very good pass defense so far thus year. And they are on the road. Tampa Bay is at Buffalo. So Jameis, get, a, get another option because even if he's playing, he's less than 100% against a good defense. Next, we move to Emmanuel Sanders. I wrote about this in depth in my waiver wire sheet, uh, talking about Benny Fowler. Now, Sanders has, uh, he has a sprained ankle, right? And he was ruled out of week seven immediately, which means at best, he's questionable for week eight and he's, he's uh, week to week at this point. So if you're a Sanders owner, I would side on the pessimistic point of view because anytime it's like, you know, they rule him out, look at what happened with Corey Davis. They've been saying he's close to coming back for like five weeks now. He's already ruled out again. 
So he's week to week. Look at Sanders and Demaryius Thomas. They've combined for over 40% of the team's targets. Now, you know, you're thinking, you're like, ah, that's really like, is that really that much, 40% if of just like the top two wide receivers? That's probably around the league, around what other people do, right? Not though. Like when you look at it this way, you realize Demaryius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders have combined for about the same amount of targets as Benny Fowler, A.J. Derby, Jeff Foreman, Virgil Green, C.J. Anderson, Jamal Charles, Devonta Booker, Jordan Taylor, Cody Lattimore, any receiving back tight end wide receiver combined for the same amount of targets as just those two players, it's kind of crazy. And it's always been, it's been like this for years, right? Those two guys just get fed, the wide receiver one and two. Um, Benny Fowler has been the third most targeted receiver in this offense, or the third most targeted player. He has like 24, I think, 23 or 23 or 24, 25 targets right now. So he's the next guy up. He uh, will become a full-time player. He actually played the most snaps for the Broncos offense in week six among the receivers because Sanders went down, obviously, and DT was kind of in and out. Now, the target number should rise considerably. He saw a career-high eight targets uh, in this last week with Sanders going out. I mean, obviously, they were trailing to the Giants for, like, the whole game, so you take that with a grain of salt. But, you know, Fowler's not the worst plug-in, right? He, he's bigger than Sanders. He's, like, 6'1", 215. Pretty good speed for a receiver that size, like, 4'5", 240. Puts him in, like, the... 80th percentile speed adjusted weight speed score that kind of shit all you can find all that stuff on playerprofiler.com and he's also in like the 82nd percentile for spark score i know y'all fantasy geeks love that shit so figured i'd throw it in there you know he scored two touchdowns in week one really hasn't done anything since but interestingly enough that week one matchup was against the chargers and that's who they get in week seven now casey hayward's probably going to be like draped all over dt which means Fowler should get some open looks, right? They should get a lot of targets his way if they're passing the ball, which I don't know if that's going to happen because the Chargers are not good against the run. Um, so they should probably attack on the ground. But with DT getting Hayward, uh, Fowler should see like a minimum of like seven to eight targets in this game. And I think he can give you like 60 to 70% of the production that Sanders was giving you or can give you on a week to week basis. You know, Sanders is one of those like big play guys down the field can make things happen. And Fowler, you look back at his senior year at Michigan State, he was averaging 17.3 yards per catch, which tells you, you know, big playmaker. And that was on 36 receptions. So not like a fluke, not small sample size. He's one of those guys that can play down the field. I also think it's an uptick for AJ Derby overall, as long as Sanders is out, of course. Um, he's been inconsistent, but he's flashed pretty good uh, numbers throughout the year at times. Let me check my phone real quick before I run out of breath. I actually gotta change the battery because this thing's about to die. All right, my camera battery's dead. The backup's dead. Everybody dead, everything dead. My phone is not dead. So we're filming this from my iPhone right now. I apologize if the audio or the video or something's weird here, but it's coming from the iPhone. And where did we leave off? The Golden Tate, that was the next injury. Decided to do like the rock bottom, do a couple flips. He fucked up his shoulder, sprained AC joint. It's week to week. They have a bye in week seven. They said he's supposed to miss a couple weeks. So we'll see. You know, it's Golden Tate's a pretty tough dude. I'll give him that. So they get week seven to rest. He might be back for week eight. I think most reports are saying that he's probably going to be out for week eight, if not longer. Uh, they have a really tough matchup against uh, Pittsburgh on Sunday Night Football in week eight. They've given up the fewest fantasy points to the wide receiver position on the season so far. So it's not exactly a matchup you probably wanted him with anyways. So it would probably be better if you're a fantasy owner for him to sit there. Marvin Jones will get a big boost, right? Over the last three games, he's led the team in receiving yards in every single week. Last week, he tied Golden Tate with 96, but he led the team in week four, in week five, and tied for the lead in week six. He has 27 targets, or 20, 26 targets over the last three games, which is almost nine targets a game. And if Golden Tate's out, right, Marvin Jones is going to be the centerpiece of that passing offense. It's going to be tough to get anything going against Pittsburgh, but he's going to get the volume there. So he's like a wide receiver, high-end wide receiver three with upside just based on the volume. And you have Kenny Galladay, man, still like suffering with this hamstring injury that's kept him out for weeks already. But hopefully, you know, through the bye, he'll be, he was close to playing in week six. So they get the bye. He should be good to go in week eight. Still not practicing as of this morning, which is Wednesday morning. So we'll have to kind of wait on that. But he's not the worst pickup. If you hear reports over next week that Tate's probably going to sit, Galladay can be plugged in as like a desperate flex play. TJ Jones has been playing most of the time while, while Galladay's been sitting, right? He's played in, I think, like between 65 and 75% of the snaps in the three games that Galladay's missed so far. Um, 
But in weeks one to three, Galladay outsnapped TJ Jones 123 to 49. So if he's on the field, he's the preferred passing option, the wide receiver three in these sets for the Lions. So, uh, I mean, Jones hasn't done anything while he's been out. He's caught like eight balls for 78 yards over the last three weeks. So Galladay is another guy you can keep your eye on in deeper leagues if Golden Tate is out. Again, not a great matchup against Pittsburgh. Um, then we have DeMarco Murray. Again, dealing with this tightness in the hammy. This is like, I feel like this is a situation that's really never, ever going to play. It's at least not in 2017 is going to play itself out. This is the first week where Derrick Henry actually outsnapped DeMarco Murray on the air. Even the, the week that DeMarco left with the with the, the tightness in his hamstring and he missed the entire second half, he still outsnapped Henry just from the first half alone. Henry outsnapped him 40 to 38 in this game. Obviously outrushing him because he broke free on that like 70 yard touchdown run at the end. But Murray was having a good game in itself. I think he scored like 18 half-point fantasy points. Anyways, um, Henry obviously came away with a really big day. I don't think we're ever going to get to the bottom of this because as long as Murray's healthy, they're not going to just give the keys to the backfield to Henry. Murray's a much better pass catching back. They trust <coughs> they trust him on third downs. They trust him as, as a pass blocker. Now, in week seven, they play the Browns, right? They're just five-and-a-half-point favorites, which is actually kind of surprising. Mariota is probably still less than 100%. You saw him like take it easy on a few plays. He was like diving as soon as he got out of the pocket. So he'll probably be less than 100%. I think they're still going to lean on the ground game, even though Cleveland has surprisingly been the best run D in the NFL. They're tied with the Broncos, allowing just three yards of carry to opposing rushers on the year. And uh, even when you look at football outsiders or DVOA, which is basically like when people throw up rankings like yards per carry and rushing yards allowed per game, those are there's so many factors that can go into that. Like what if a team, if for instance, like the Ravens just let up 170 yards to Jordan Howard or whatever, but that doesn't mean that he was efficient, right? So DVOA from Football Outsiders basically takes like efficiency into the calculation and they're still ranked third overall in the NFL in terms of DVOA rushing defense. So the Browns are actually not as easy of a matchup as you would think because they, you know, they're, they're trailing a lot, so teams are uh, really like to run on them. Obviously, when you're up, you want to run, and that's what they've been doing, and they've still have been very efficient. So if I don't think Murray's supposed to miss time, but it's still a concern. If he plays, I would say both of them are, are low to mid RB2s, and I'm not like super comfortable playing either, but I would, I would probably throw either of them in my RB2 flex because they'll get um, a bunch of touches each. Last injury, I think. Hopefully this is the last. Hope I didn't miss any. Uh, Robert Turbin snapped his whole arm up and shit like he was walking. He was walking like dead fish limp to the sidelines. His shit was all cracked up. Turbin's going to be out for the year. What do you want? Ooh, brand partnership email. I'll check out what that is and I'll update you guys later. You know what's so cool about being like a... I guess I can call myself a micro-influencer now because I kind of have a decent following on YouTube. I just get random emails from my companies asking me to like brand partnership with them and they just send me free shit it's great oh here's actually one right here this glasses company firmo i'm not even, i didn't even mean to plug this but i'll plug it now anyways firmo they're like this glasses company they have a ton of different options on the site cool case too it's like the world firmo f-i f-i-r-m-o-o and they gave me a, a promo code to give to you guys. I forget what it was, but I think it's, it's either buy one, get one free or buy one, get one half off for all the sun, the glasses on their site. They have a ton of them. They're really high quality. I actually really like these. Um, so I'll link the promo code in the description if you're looking to check them out. Now would be the time to buy sunglasses. I know it's not summer anymore. Or for some of you guys, maybe it is if you're in Cali. Summer all the time. But the market is down. The sales are up, right? People are looking to, people should be looking to buy now because the prices are cheaper because it's not summer. So go check out Fermo.com. Um, I'll give you guys a promo code. I'll link it down there so you guys can go check it out. But that's the cool thing about being this micro influencer. Companies just want to give you shit so I could, I could just shout them out and then hopefully you guys buy some stuff. <sighs> Anyways, yeah. Uh, so Robert Turbin, what was I saying? Yeah, Robert Turbin's arm basically looked like, like that. Or, ooh, no, that's like Gordon Hayward's ankle. Robert Turbin's arm just looked like it was like... Um, Turbin was really only averaging five touches a game. So it's not really like... What it does is kind of give you more peace of mind with Frank Gore and Marla Max, So the value goes up because you don't have to worry about Turbin catching passes or stealing goal line runs. So both of their um, numbers will go up. I, I like, I really like this from Marla Mack. You guys know how high I was on him to begin with. And now that Turbin's out of the picture, you know, they said they want to get Mac more involved and get him more touches. He earned that and didn't happen this last week. They still kept feeding Gore and didn't give really Mac anything to work with. 
But, you know, he's averaging 4.8 yards per carry, or like 11 and a half yards per reception. So we've seen the efficiency there. And I think like with Turbin out, both of them will get an uptick. And eventually Mac will kind of turn this into a timeshare. I think so. So Turbin out, up for Mac, up for Gore. And we'll move over to, as I always say, my wide receiver cornerback matchups I'm no longer doing in the video. It comes out as a blog post tomorrow morning. So Thursday morning, well, like probably like noon to two o'clock. I will email you guys out for those of you that are on my newsletter. Make sure you are subscribed on my website and that will get to you. It's like a blog post. I'll get that to you tomorrow afternoon. So we move to must starts. Wow, I'm moving quickly. Don't take PEDs. Tyrod Taylor is my must start quarterback for the week. Tyrod's just my guy, man. He's my guy this week. I love when people count him out. I love when people throw him down because Tyrod is the guy that bounces back from all criticism. You say he's not a good quarterback, he shows you he is. You say he can't win. He wins. God damn it. Tyrod Taylor, my guy this week. Playing against Tampa Bay. They're awful against quarterback. Letting up the third most fantasy points to quarterback on the year. Second most passing yards per game. Like 309 passing yards a game on the season. They're on average letting up two passing touchdowns per game to opposing quarterbacks. Tyrod's coming off the bye. Jordan Matthews is practicing again. Which means he might have Jordan Matthews back. Even though he lost Charles Clay. Getting Jordan Matthews back is huge. Because he needs someone out there besides Shady to help him. Right? Tyrod's not been the most consistent. I get he's played kind of poorly, but at home he's played really well. And that was against the Broncos, and that was against the Jets, too. Well, Jets are underrated pass defense. The Broncos obviously are the best pass defense in the league. And he played very well. He threw for over 210 yards against both teams and score and passed for multiple touchdowns against both teams. He had eight rushing attempts against both teams as well for like 51 rushing yards. So he's played really well on the year. And I know you want to say he's like dinking and dumping. And his average depth of target and throw is not great, but it is just below Alex Smith, Kirk Cousins, Cam Newton on the year. So he's not like opposed to taking the deep shots. You saw it with Charles Clay, which sucks because he's out. But I think Nick O'Leary will be able to step in and he'll be completely competent there and be able to catch passes for Tyrod. So I'm a fan of Tyrod. He gets a great matchup. He's at home where he has excelled this year. Coming off a bye, I think they'll be ready to roll. For what it's worth, I'm starting Tyrod in my E-Town Get Down League because Deshaun Watts. Oh, I made that trade, by the way, the one I talked about last week or two weeks ago. I traded Drew Brees, DeMarco Murray, Travis Kelsey for Deshaun Watson, Julio, Jordan Howard, and Delaney Walker. So I made the trade. So I have Deshaun Watson now. He's on a bye. I'm starting Tyrod in my E-Town Get Down League. I need a dub there. And uh, if you were somehow debating Dak Prescott like a, a, versus another quarterback this week, definitely get Dak Prescott in your lineup. Wide receiver, Rashard Matthews. I feel like I put him on the list every week, and you guys are probably like, dude, shut your freaking mouth about Shard. Shard let me down this week, man. I mean, he played very well. They just are not feeding him the ball. Um, but, you know, Mariota, another week healthier, another um, week of rest. He'll be able to move around a little more than he was last week. They should let him kind of open up a little more. And they go against the Browns, right? Corey Davis has already ruled out with that hamstring injury, so who knows when he's if he's ever coming back, right? Shard is quietly sitting at wide receiver 28 in fantasy, but he has the 17th most receiving yards. He has the 19th most targets, and he doesn't have a single drop on the year. And among wide receivers with at least 40 targets on the year, there's only 20 of them, but among the 20 that have 40 targets, he has the single highest yards per reception at 14.7. He's above Antonio Brown. He's above all these other guys that have this many targets. Shard is the highest yards per reception. So they're hitting him deep. And he's catching almost every ball that's coming his way. So eventually that's going to turn into more fantasy points. They just need to feed him in the end zone. They're not capitalizing on goal line looks. They keep kicking these goddamn field goals. RIP, shout out to anyone who was going against Ryan Suckup last week. I would have, yeah, <coughs> this laptop, probably that phone too, would be fucking broken if I lost the game. Because Ryan Suckup hit like 32 field goals. Um, back to their matchup though. Cleveland, per Football Outsiders, is ranked dead last against opposing teams wide receiver ones. They've let up a touchdown to every single wide receiver one on the opposing team that they've played this year. It's A.J. Green, Macklin, T.Y. Hilton, A.J. Green again, Jermaine Curse, then DeAndre Hopkins, as well as Will Fuller in that game. So they are getting chewed up by wide receiver ones, and I expect the same with Rashard Matthews as Corey Davis is out again. Mariota is getting more healthy. So fire up Shard Matthews this week. Running back, Carlos Hyde. Yo, I cannot stand the media. I cannot stand people that were on Matt Breida. If you listen to shit I was saying last week, I told all you guys mostly to start Callers Hyde on the fantasy football podcast. I was like, get Hyde in your lineups. A um, lot of chatter. This is where you need to differentiate the noise from the facts. 
The facts of the matter is that Carlos Hyde's a beast. He's a savage. He's a savant. Ain't no Matt Breida, 5'10", 185 pound ass, going to take his job. Nah, he's, I think he's bigger than that. Matt Breida's actually pretty good. But I'm riding Carlos Hyde again here for sure. It's going against Dallas, the Cowboys. Now, they've led up 115 rushing yards to the starting running back of three of the five teams they've played so far. The only two that they didn't were the Giants in week one, who literally had no ground game at that point, and then the Cardinals, who didn't have AP yet. So it was Andre Ellington there, and like Kerwin Williams and Chris Johnson. So when they're playing a good running back, they've let up at least 115 yards, and that includes CJ Anderson, Todd Gurley, Aaron Jones. Now, those two running backs that didn't, both had at least five catches and uh, 50 yards. So they can be beat on the ground, they can be beat through the air by running backs. I know Sean Lee is going to be back probably this week. He's practicing, but they also had him against C.J. Anderson when he went for 150 total yards in week one or week two, I think it was. Um, the Breida talk was nonsense. Carlos Hyde outsnapped him like 56 to 17 last week. Out touched him 18 to six. Hyde's getting the looks, the targets, the carries. It's currently RB seven in fantasy right now. And listen to this stat: he's over 500 total yards and four touchdowns right now in the year. If you pace out what he has right now for the, for the season long, he's on pace for 1,340 total yards, 10.6 touchdowns, and 61 receptions. That would have made him last year, a year that the running backs absolutely exploded, RB3 in PPR leagues for fantasy football. The only players that would have beat him were Zeke and David Johnson. That's how good Carlos Hyde is this year. And if you think that they're just magically going to hand the keys over to Brita, use a fool. Good matchup against Dallas. Fire Carlos Hyde up without hesitation. Tight end. Who are we looking at right now? Uh, you know what's crazy? While the tight end position this year is like, you, if you you really only could have drafted like Ertz, Gronk, or Kelsey and been happy with it, but for the most part, if you have a tight end that you could stream that's going against a good matchup, it's worked like 75% of the time. If you're going against like the Eagles, Cleveland, the Giants, throw a tight end in there and they're going to put up like 8 to 10 points for you and you'll be fine. Um, you know, the easy ones this week are Delaney Walker's against Cleveland, Jimmy Graham's against the Giants, Ertz versus the Redskins, but that's not really like no one's going to debate that. Those are those are all obviously must-starts. I'm going to go with Austin Hooper as my must-start this week. Playing New England, he's been very, very, very good the last two weeks with Mohamed Sanu out. Now, Mohamed Sanu was expected to miss somewhere between two and four weeks, right? He missed the bye and he missed last week. I, I believe he got an unlimited practice today, so we'll have to see how he progresses. But if he's out... I expect Hooper to have another huge, huge, huge game, or at least in terms of like usage. He's still available in 53% of Yahoo leagues, or he's owned in 53% of Yahoo leagues. You look at this matchup, right? Yeah, I get it. All right, 28 to 3. Very, 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 oh, dude, hilarious. Very original, whoever's going to write that down below. I'm going to send you free merchandise because you are so fucking funny. Anyways, right, Super Bowl rematch here. The over-under is enormous, 55 points. They're expecting a shootout in Foxborough. New England is allowing the fourth most fantasy points to the tight end position. The only ones that are worse than them are the three I mentioned above who are facing Jimmy Graham, Delaney Walker, Zach Ertz. Uh, they've allowed a touchdown to the tight end position, New England has, in every single week except for week four when they played the Panthers. And Ed Dixon had three catches for 62 yards. And I think in this, you know, this year for tight ends, like you'll take that as a fantasy game. Um, Hooper set a career high in targets in week four. In week four, yeah, he had seven targets, which was a career high. They had a buy in week five, and then he broke that career high last week with nine targets. He's caught 12 balls over the last two games um, after catching just five passes in the first three weeks combined. So the usage is going shooting up, right? A lot of people, including myself, thought Taylor Gabriel was going to be a big factor. I also said Sanu out Hooper was going to be, in my waiver wire sheet, I said Hooper was definitely going to get a boost as well, but he's been getting the biggest boost with Sanu out. This one is just a layup for me, right? Great matchup, really high scoring game, uh, terrible against tight ends, New England. If Sanu is out, it should be just like a, Hooper should easily get another seven to nine targets, should catch five to six balls, 50 to 60 yards, and I actually think he gets in the end zone. So fire Hooper out. Fire Hooper out. Don't fire him out. Fire him up. Put him in your lineups. That's all I got from me for the must starts. We move over to must sits. I don't really like doing must sits because it's very dependent on who else you have on your lineup. But a couple guys I don't really love this week. It's obvious ones at quarterback are Rivers against Denver. Eli against Seattle. I would say Derek Carr against Kansas City as well. He just hasn't looked good. He hasn't looked himself even when he was healthy. So offense is just not really moving well. 
Um, that that back issue. I mean, it said he said it didn't hamper him at all. I, I feel like he's clearly under less than 100%. So I'm getting someone else out there for Derek Carr if I can. Like I said, Tyrod Taylor. He's probably available on your waiver wire. So don't play Rivers. Don't play Eli. Don't play Derek Carr. Running back. I do have one that's probably going to be iffy for a lot of you guys, and that's Jarek McKinnon. Now, they're going against Baltimore. Baltimore's been awful against the run the last couple games. But listen to this. As per Roto World, over the last four games without Williams, Brandon Williams, they're the Ravens' beast of a nose tackle, the Ravens have been shredded on the ground to the tune of 169.5 yards per game. In the two games Williams played, Baltimore allowed 85 yards per game rushing. So it's night and day when this guy's in the lineup. He is practicing this week. He is expected to play. If he does, that is a big downgrade to the runners on Minnesota, who, again, are going to be with Case Keenum. Don't think that's really an, uh, a valid point at this point going forward because they've had plenty of production with Keenum at the quarterback position. But I'm just saying. Um, in PPR leagues, I'm fine with McKinnon because he's still the clear pass catcher there. But the snaps are starting to kind of even themselves out. As I said, like I wasn't expecting what we saw in week five from McKinnon. Last week, it was 44 to 33 snaps in favor of McKinnon over Latavius Murray. The touch count was much closer as well, 21 to 16. Um, but I don't know. A lot of things just don't line up for McKinnon for me this week. If you have a better option, I'd use it. And, um, you know, Latavius Murray saw six carries inside the red zone in week six compared to just two for McKinnon. So you see who they want to use down there. And it's not like the Ravens get beat through the air from running backs. I think the best game on the year for a receiving back was Le'Veon Bell, obviously, in week four, caught four balls for 42 yards. So they're not getting shredded through the air by running backs, and they're not getting uh, hit on the ground while Brandon Williams is in the lineup. So it should be an interesting game. I think the over-under is pretty, pretty small in this game as well. Let me check that. But I like the Ravens actually to surprise a lot of people this week. And I think they'll, they'll play a lot better with Williams back. On that front, fat boy got to eat. Ravens-Vikings over under 39.5, so not expected. That's 16 points lower than the, the Falcons-Pats uh, game. So McKinnon, again, I'd look elsewhere. Jason Witten, he's my tight end that you must sit. 49ers have been very bad against the pass or against wide receivers. But they've been great against tight ends for whatever reason. Tight ends are averaging, I think, five fantasy points a game against them. They rank number one in, in points against them for fantasy tight ends. And they're even number one in DVOA per football outsiders against tight ends. I haven't really looked it up. I'm guessing there's a linebacker or a safety who is just really, really, really surprisingly good in coverage this year. And that's the reason why tight ends aren't performing. They're allowing just three and a half catches and 34 yards to position each week as a whole. That's just not that's just not like tight end one. That's any all tight ends combined each week. Um, you know, and that includes guys like Greg Olson, Jimmy Graham, Jordan Reed. So it's not like they've been playing no names. They've been doing it against guys who who you know have done it before and who can produce. So uh, if they can't do it, I'm not high on Jason Witten. You know, they're they're still going to have Zeke this game. They're definitely going to look to control the clock, ground and pound, stick to that game plan that they've been using for the last couple of years. That's going to eat a lot of clock, and I really don't see Witten, you know, giving you anything more than like four, maybe five standard fantasy points. Coming off a big game, right? Eight for 61 against the Packers, which was kind of surprising, but if you look at the two games prior to that, Witten had two dud games. It was like a combined two catches for 12 yards over those two games combined. So Witten's not a guy I want in my lineup this week, even though the matchup looks good. It's really not actually good in theory or on paper. Mm. It looks good in paper and on theory. But just don't play Witten. Then we'll move over to buy low. Buy low. So must starts, must sits. Buy low. Buy low is my boy Julio. I just traded for him. I think he was my buy low last week as well. You know, they're just not getting involved in the red zone. And they're going to keep underutilizing him or they have been. What I like is the fact that, you know, now it's finally coming out and they're saying, Jesus, bro, I get a lot of emails. Um... Coming out, and, and the, the coaches are starting to take a lot of slack for this. Why are you not getting the best athlete on the planet involved? Uh, you know, we need to get him. Yeah, no fucking, obviously, Dan Quinn. Like, throw the fucking ball to Julio. Even when he's not open, he's open. He's a freak. Just throw him the damn ball, and he'll make plays. What I love about Julio as a Falcons fan is that he doesn't come out and complain, right? He doesn't cause a fucking fit like Antonio Brown or Odell or any of these wide receivers would, right? Julio just does his thing. You throw him the ball, he'll make plays. 
The more people complain about it, the more Dan Quinn will hear it. And eventually they're going to start forcing him the ball. And they're going to feed him. And I think it's going to happen sooner rather than later. He still has – listen to these matchups that he has left, right? He takes New England on this week. He has the Jets. He has Dallas. From weeks 13 to 16, which is like the end of your season and fantasy playoffs, Tampa Bay, New Orleans, Tampa Bay, New Orleans. Those four games in a matter of four weeks. Like, that's absurd for, for fantasy matchups for Julio. Like, Tampa Bay is getting shredded through the air, and the Saints obviously are just not a good... Uh... Oh, the Vikings play them week 13. I'm sorry. So it's the Bucks week 12, Vikings, then Saints, Bucks, Saints. Both of those teams get absolutely shredded through the air. Julio is going to have a couple breakout games down the stretch. So buy Julio now if you can on the low-low. Another receiver that I really like is Keenan Allen, too, on the low. He's having trouble getting those big games. He hasn't scored since week one, but he's completely healthy, and a completely healthy Keenan Allen is going to be a monster in PPR. He's on pace for 163 targets and about 1,200 yards. He's just not scoring the touchdowns, and he's not getting the long plays, which he really never gets. But he hasn't had under nine targets in a single game yet this year. Um, they played Denver in week seven, so you might want to hold off on trying to trade for him now. Wait till he has one more bag. Even though, which is weird, I was looking at the splits, he actually plays just as well against Denver as he does against other defenses. Maybe it's like an individual rival kind of pump, like Phillip Rivers, like making one of those weird ass phases, gets Keenan Allen pumped up. I don't know, for whatever reason, I'd probably wait on trying to trade, see if Keenan Allen has a bad game against Denver, and then go for him. Because that would be like a few bad games in a row, but I'm still very high on Keenan just based on the usage. Sell high guys. I don't have a lot of like great sell high guys I want to like talk about right now. I would say I like the idea of selling Derrick Henry high, if you can. Like I said, I still think this backfield is completely a uh, an RBBC. As long as Murray is in the lineup and playing, there are not going to be like bell cow opportunities for Henry. They're going to split the workload. They're going to split the snaps. And that's going to be the story as long as Murray is in the lineup. So if someone is on the thought process that Derrick Henry just had that big game because of that one big run and he's going to be like the clear RB1 and, and do a lot of shit going forward, there's someone I would try to target against and be like, oh, listen, I'll trade you Derrick Henry for you know a Mike Evans who's struggling or a Julio or like a Derrick Henry and maybe another wide receiver for one of those high wide receivers. That's something I would do. Uh, I would also sell any of the Pats running backs outside of Deion Lewis. I talked about Deion Lewis in my waiver wire. He was my number one pickup this week. He is, Lewis has been, he's probably like top three favorite players in the NFL for me. I've loved him for like the last three years. He is amazing when he's healthy and he's clearly the best back in this backfield. And we saw him finally get the snaps and the usage that he should be getting. And what's crazy is he is probably also like top three best receiving backs in the league. He's like right up there with Le'Veon Bell, uh, Christian McCaffrey, and probably the best open field player in the entire NFL. And they have not been even giving him passing downs. As soon as they realize that they can give Lewis more work, give him like, he doesn't, he's not going to take the James White role outright, but I think he should be the early down back. And he's been getting the carries just as much as Gillisley has. Gillisley had that, that fumble that he lost in the game. And that was basically benched for the remainder of the game outside of a few late carries. But Lewis was the guy they're giving him goal line uh, carries too, even when Gillis Lee's active. So that's always a good sign. Deion Lewis is just, he's someone, there are not a lot of guys in fantasy football like week six or seven into your season that pass the eye test with flying colors and have opportunity to, um, to take moving forward. And I see Deion Lewis as both of those. Like there's no question he passed the eye test, but it's not like James White or Mike Gillisley have done anything that says Deion Lewis can't take their jobs. So I actually bid, I think I, I grabbed Deion Lewis in my E-Town Get Down League. I got rid of Gill and I grabbed him for like $13 fab budget out of my out of my hundred. I'm, I'm kind of low on fab now. So that was a big move for me. I'm really going to be counting him at him as a flex play moving forward. So I'm very high on Deion Lewis. If you could sell Gillisley based on the name or James White in a PPR league, I would probably do that. So that's where I land on my sell highs. The next section, as always, I do my fantasy football league recaps. And this right here. My E-Town get down matchup. Lost by like six points. Took that L to Iz, Don Lagotka. That's uh, my friend Nick Redhead that you guys have seen on the channel before. Going into Monday Night Football, I needed a combined 20 points from Rashard Matthews and Delaney Walker. This is half point PPR, half point first down. So I'm like, I have to get 20 points from those two, right? With this. I'm like going in, believe me, I didn't feel good. I never feel good about going into a Monday Night Football game down points. 
somehow didn't get it. And what's what the most messed up part about this is like I was on the borderline of starting John Brown over Shard and Jack Doyle over Delaney Walker because they're both on my back. I picked up Jack Doyle this week because I was like, if Mariota doesn't go, I'm definitely playing those guys over uh, the Titans. Turns out he did go and it was still the fucking wrong move because had I played Jack Doyle or John Brown over Rashard Matthews, I would have won this game. And then last second, I threw in Mike Gillisley over Samaj P. Ryan. <sighs> I'm so mad at Mike Gillisley. I, I dumped his ass, like I said, for Deion Lewis. So I'm done with that shit show they call him in, in New England. Now, I'm sitting in fifth place. Uh, four four teams getting to the playoffs, so I'm still very much in in there, despite losing OBJ, Allen Robinson, Danny Woodhead, Chris Carson, Charles Clay. We're still chugging forward. And like I told you guys before, I made that trade, and that's why my lineup looks a lot different now. But I'm, I'm, I'm definitely liking it a lot more now than I was prior to the trade. Next up, we have my subscribers only league. Luckily, I took a dub there. Um, the Most of my team sucked this week, but Carson Palmer and Melvin Gordon went off. So I took the dub. I'm currently in sixth place out of 14 teams. So that'll get me in the playoffs. But I know that week one game is going to bite me in the air. I played OBJ in my flex and he obviously didn't play. He wasn't active for week one and I lost by 0.1 points. And I feel like, I, I know I bring that up like every week, but I feel like that's going to end up biting me in the ass. If I'm on like fringe borderline playoff spot, that's going to kill me. I needed that one game. Next league is my college buddies. We've been doing this league for basically in college since I graduated too. So that's like, I don't know, five, six years. Laid the absolute smack down this week. My team went off. I love my team in this league. I'm somehow two and four in seventh place, but I have the second most points scored. I just have like a ridiculously high amount of like by far the most points scored against me. So I'm getting unlucky here, but like the point, I, I feel like they'll, if my team is good, I'll keep winning and the points will work themselves out where I, I you know, you win tiebreakers. And when you're only playing 13 regular season fantasy games, tiebreakers can be huge because a lot of the time you're going to be tied with players win loss. So I'm sitting good there, even though I'm two and four teams doing very well. Lastly, we have the fantasy jocks office league. This is not on Yahoo. This is on SleeperBot. A lot of you guys probably haven't heard of this website, and I've, this is the first time I've ever used it, but they're like a fantasy league site. Kind of weird. I don't really like it, to be honest with you. Not a lot of the features that Yahoo has, and doesn't make it very easy. They have to update this a lot. This is a 14-team league. My team did, for 14 teams, 112 points is very good. This is half PPR, no bonuses or anything like that. My t and this is also without kickers, too. So 112, 14-team league without kickers. My team did really well. But again, I needed 25 from Jacoby and Rashard Matthews going into Monday night. Shard let me down again. Let me down in all types of ways. Uh, the worst part about this was the 112 points would have, I would have beaten any of the other 12 teams. I just happened to go against the highest scoring team in the league. So I took the L. Um, I'm in seventh place out of 14. So I'm one spot out of the playoffs. But again, I have the second most points scored. So I'm on the, board, I'm on the borderline. So I'm basically on the borderline of playoffs in every one of my leagues. And I've been scoring a lot of points, so I think I think eventually it'll work itself out, and I'm and I'm sitting pretty good for the amount of injuries I've had in most of my leagues. And lastly, we have the locks of the century for y'all gambling folks. Last week I went a little overboard and I picked six games. I don't know why. I was just feeling myself, and I was like, I had a bad week the week before. I think I went one and two, so I was like, I gotta redeem myself with six picks. Ended up going three and three. I'm not going to recap all the games for you. Maybe I'll take a screenshot here and I'll put it up on uh, the board for you. The one I was pissed off about, I went 3-3. Three and three. I'm 8-9 and nine on the year. I could have went 4-2 and two last week. I took the Rams, Jacksonville, under 42.5. They only scored 44 despite scoring 14 points in the first 15 seconds of the game. That was ridiculous. I mean, that's what happens when you gamble, folks. That's like you just – shit never goes your way. 8-9 and nine on the year. This year, this week, week 7, I have three more picks for you all. I got Tennessee at Cleveland over 46 and a half. Mariota, another week healthier. That offense is going to be running pretty smooth against Cleveland. Deshaun Kaiser back in the lineup. Not saying he's good, but he's turnover prone and he's big play prone. So either of those is good for the over. If you're going to throw picks, the other team's going to obviously have good field position. If you're going to make big plays, you're going to score points. I like over 46 and a half. I like Baltimore plus five and a half at Minnesota. Baltimore's defense is going to be rounding back into shape with Brandon Williams coming back. I don't think Minnesota is particularly in a good spot here with their offense. We'll see how it shakes out, but I like Baltimore plus five and a half. I think they're a good team all around, probably getting Macklin back. I'm not really sure. And lastly, we have the Jets at Miami over 38 and a half. Obviously, both these teams are not good at scoring, but 38 and a half, I feel like we could probably, we could probably get 39 points in, in an NFL game. Like it should happen. 
Um, I'm going to check Roto World for you guys real quick to see what other injuries we have. Devontae Parker is not practicing Wednesday. He remains day-to-day. We're going to need to see Parker out there Thursday or Friday to see if he's playing against the Jets. So Parker is questionable. If he doesn't suit up, then Kenny Stills is a play. Um, they're going to have to ride Jay Ajayi because they don't really have any consistent outside plays. So you're going to need a replacement for Parker. Jeremy Macklin is practicing. He missed week six. He should be good to go. He runs a lot of his snaps out of the slot. So he might avoid Xavier Rhodes. Jeremy Macklin is a sneaky good play against Minnesota. Terrence West is not practicing. So that leaves Alex Collins and Buck Allen to get most of the carries against Minnesota. A good rush defense. Not really high on either of them um, playing this week, even though Alex Collins outcarried Buck Allen. Allen still dominated him in snaps for the week and probably will again. So I'm just waiting for Woodhead to come back because I'm so sick of, of Buck Allen, bro. Mohamed, Mohamed Sanu did return to practice Wednesday. It puts him on track to return week seven. Now, I don't know. Hamstring injuries, like I said, are always kind of confusing. Just keep an eye on that. That's obviously a downgrade for Hooper. But if you're desperate, I would still be fine using Hooper because he did. I think he went in the Super Bowl matchup. He caught three balls for 31 yards and a touchdown. So he did it last year. He's been good the last few games. New England sucks against the pass. He could still be used for sure. Winston limited in practice. Winston's doing very little on Wednesday. Yeah, I like it's going to be very questionable game time decision for him. But either way, like I said, tough matchup. Go get a backup. So Shepard returned to practice Wednesday. Appeared to be limited, but it's a step in the right direction after he sat out against the Broncos, obviously. The Giants play. Who did the Giants play this week? I think the Giants play the, I'm just going to keep saying the until I eventually see it on the screen, the Seahawks. So uh, he's going to see a lot of Richard Sherman. Probably not the best matchup for Shepard there either, even though he should see a very nice boost in targets. Him and Evan Ingram are the only things in that passing offense. So probably not, I really don't want to see Shepard as anything more than like a low wide receiver three flex, but fire up Evan Ingram. No problem. That's really it. No other injury. So that's going to wrap up the video. Before we go, make sure you give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. Again, my notable wide receiver cornerback matchup sheet, which was fucking on point last week. I had Golden Tate, d a couple other ones that just hit and went monstrous. Um, that will come out tomorrow, like Thursday. I'll put the link in the description for that as well as the other blog posts I had. That'll be around like noon to 2 o'clock. Make sure you subscribe to the newsletter on my website, which is also linked below. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on the gram. Just follow me everywhere. You can come to my house and follow me to the supermarket if you want it. I don't really care. Give it that thumbs up, and I'll see y'all on the live stream on Sunday. Make sure you have notifications on for this video because every Sunday we live stream, baby. My favorite time of the week. Oh, shit. I might not be around Sunday. Oh, TBD. To be determined. Follow me on Twitter, and I'll let y'all know.